And welcome to the Podcasters Row. This is King of Podcasts, welcoming you to another episode. Thank you for listening in, and thank you for the response on the first couple of episodes we've already put it together of the program. Of course, everything you can find out about the program is at kingofpodcasts.com. Again, kingofpodcasts.com. And let me go ahead and start with our guest for this episode. Now, she is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, a keynote speaker, consultant, and award-winning podcaster on leadership and self-confidence. Host of what is uh, called the, the Tao of Self-Confidence. Tao, if you didn't really know what that is, it's not just the name of an album by Rick Springfield. <laughs> Sorry, I had to just throw that in there. But it's um, defined as a way or a path, the principle upon which the religious and philosophical traditions of Taoism are based. So the Tao of Self-Confidence, our host is Sheena Yap Chan. Uh, Sheena, thank you for being on. Thank you so much for having me here. It's such an honor to be here today to, um, yeah, just talk about podcasting. <laughs> so, specifically, you're interviewing other Asian women about their inner journey to self-confidence. And so far, you've already interviewed over 800 women. So, I mean, is this where, you, would you would say that the Tao of Self-Confidence podcast really is, it's an exercise in, you know, the kind of a, the thought process of where there's ESG or there's diversity, equity, inclusion, is it something where you just feel like you want to create, create this avenue for the voice to showcase the path of these female guests? Yeah, I mean, um, I started this podcast in 2015, so it was way before you know right. DEI programs and ESGs. <clears throat> for me, it was really about providing a voice for Asian women and to dismantle the negative stereotypes we go through. Because until now, we're still seen as quiet, submissive, and obedient. We're seen as sex objects. We're um, we're not. We're rarely seen in leadership roles. If you look at the reports, Asian women have one of the lowest. And for me, when I started this podcast, I just really wanted to have first first and foremost a support system for Asian women who are dealing with confidence issues because. I was dealing with my own issues and then I couldn't find any resources that literally catered for Asian women. And because culturally we're not told to share what we feel, how we're doing, everyone thinks we're fine. Um, Second of all is representation. For me, representation was so important because growing up in Toronto, Canada, in the early 90s, I never saw anybody that looked like me on the media. No role models to look up to. I felt ashamed of my own culture. I wanted to have blonde hair and blue eyes to feel more Western. And so for me, the podcast is really showcasing Asian women, sharing their stories, being able to relate to others because, you know, sometimes in the world of social media, we see all the pretty pictures, the filtered photos, the filtered magazines, thinking that's what perfection looks like, not really realizing it's altered to a T. And the more we can share what we're going through, our struggles, how we're over able to overcome them, people can relate to that. People can realize if she went through a similar situation than I, the, as me, and she was able to move past it, then I can do it as well. So for me, representation always leads to more possibilities, right? Like, seeing more more asian um movies in hollywood or having someone in leadership or you know being the first person to break barriers make history uh that's really all important because uh if you look at you know even not just in america but everywhere in the world right asian women are still you know second class to men or they're still going through a lot of issues or they're still um you know struggling by their own cultural background right like in China, if you're 25 and over and still single, you're literally called the leftover. <laughs> you know, that's just that's one amazing. of the many things. <laughs> and you know what? It's uh, Maybe it's just from where, where I've done in my podcasting space where you know, we've had quite a few Asian women that have been in, in very high levels when it comes to either CEO or president. And I think we're just off the top of my head. I think of, I just recently interviewed Stephanie Wang, and who runs a company called Ka and Pathogenics. So creating products that are based from the canna plant, not cannabis but K-A-N-N-A plant in South Africa and be able to create that together. And then I'll have also, in the cannabis space, uh, if you didn't know, I actually one of the networks that I get to produce programming for and I run day-to-day operations for is Cannabis Radio. Uh, One of the major CEOs of Leafly, which is a major company that does a lot of, really as a directory, almost as a, well, not Amazon, but it just really is as a very reference directory out there 
the CEO there is Yoko Miyashita. And then I think about the fact that I remember producing a podcast for a year for a company that, that uh, was a mobile marketing platform called Rumble. And her name was Wen Chu. And now she's the president of Nationswell. I, I see a lot. And, and I never really think about, I guess, in the MySpace, I never think about the fact of, you know, in some cases, the background of who we have, that where, where they come from to become leaders. What I want to ask now is, you know, when you look at the stories that you've been told of those that have been able to make it to a certain level of as a CEO or owner or founder or as an entrepreneur that has made it to a very high place. What do you say about what have you learned about the idea where it's not so much based on merit, but there but obviously merit it plays the important role and it should. At least where I think there there's something about that to be said. That anybody is moving forward, it doesn't matter you can break all barriers if somebody that you bring to a position of importance is based on merit. But do they also care about this is what I want to ask is do they care about who comes in to replace them? If it's someone of a similar background, similar plight, is that something that you've learned from those guests? That's what they try to do to, in order to go ahead and keep the legacy there. Yeah, that is a great question. And, <clears throat> you know, after interviewing so many women, I think, you know, we just go through a lot of struggle, right? Sometimes they look at the color of our skin. They look at where we come from and is seen as a disability sometimes, right? Maybe we, especially if you have an Asian name, it's like, you know, once you have an Asian name, you're you're less likely to get promoted. You're less likely to be in those leadership roles because no one will take the time to say your name properly. And your name is the most important thing in the world, right? It's part of your identity. Um, you know, just also we have um, the model minority myth where everyone thinks all Asians are successful and that we don't need any help and we're the model citizen. But that really hurts us because then, you know, people think, oh, we're fine. Nobody, need, nobody, nobody cares about us. Um, sometimes we're not even seen in diversity programs. Right. Um, so there's a lot of different things. And I realize I know sometimes, you know, it does take work on our end. Right. Nothing happens overnight. Um, we've been taught to always just work hard and working hard is great. But there's also working smart. And one thing we were never taught to do was to network, right? To like, especially if you're at a workplace, right? You work hard all your life, but yet you're still in that same position. And why is that, right? Is it because, you know, that's all you're seen as hardworking, you put your head down, you never make any trouble. And then because of that, you're not seen as leadership material or, you know, someone to promote to the next level. Um, And this is a, this is a commonality that I see, right? And so it's important to go out there to have the confidence to network, just to even say hi to somebody, because that could lead to different opportunities. And this is why confidence is so important, because we're going to be in uncomfortable situations. I mean, it's not easy for me sometimes to go out there and network with people and, you know, be in a room with people I've never met ever in my life. But I push myself because it's not just about me. It's about every other Asian woman who feels like, they're not, um, they feel like they're not enough, or they have to do something more, or they feel like they don't see anybody else doing it. So it's not possible. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to ask this too, because there was also a guest I had on uh, another program on cannabis radio called Blunt Business. And I remember taking the, speaking with Jean Sullivan, and she's uh, works with Arcview Group, which is one of the larger investors, the larger companies in the cannabis space. And one of the things we talked about was when you have women in general that get a seat at the table in the conference room and they are looking to move themselves up. The one thing is that she made a mention of was that is a matter of speaking up that there are not, not enough women that are in the conference room themselves when they have that opportunity to speak up and be heard. And when they have ideas or they have, uh, you know, uh, concepts that will further, growth or further success they need to be able to go ahead and take that opportunity and not stay quiet now from your own experience i mean have you seen where that has been something that has been missing if you have other fellow women in a boardroom that should have that opportunity to go ahead and say something if they have a great idea take the risk go for it say it and let it be in the ether Yeah, I mean, even though some women have reached the leadership roles, I mean, as women, you know, men men and women are wired differently, of course, right? Um, As women, we're more emotional, we overthink everything, we're afraid to say something stupid, because we we don't want to sound like, you know, we're dumb, or we're being laughed at. And so sometimes we kind of just hold back a little bit, because it's like, I don't want to take, I don't want to like, 
waste the opportunity that they have, even though the idea that they have might be a great idea and they don't realize like the person next to them who's a man is probably going to say the same idea. So it's better off just saying it, right? Regardless if it sounds stupid, because as men, men shoot their shot all the time, right? Mm -hmm. They don't care if they get rejected. They don't care if it sounds stupid. All they care about is that I'm willing to do it and whatever response I get, I'm happy with it versus women we may be at 110% ready, but yet we still hold back. And because of that, there's a huge confidence gap between men and women, right? Um, you know, women are capable. Women are so capable. I'm not saying men aren't capable. I'm just saying women are capable. But because they're afraid to take action, that's what really holds them back. And the number one reason for having low self-confidence for women is due to inaction. So it's really important to step up, to speak up, to show up, and sometimes you know, part of the reasons why women don't advance as fast is because we we could also be the problem, right? You know, right. when one woman is in the leadership role, they're afraid that someone else might take it. And so, you know, they do whatever they can to stop that other woman from moving up with them, not realizing there's so much space in that table, right, mm -hmm. to move up or create our own spaces. And I know this is not always the popular opinion because they're like, how dare you? You're a woman. How could you say that? But it's true. <laughs> it's right. true. Like, as women, we get catty. We backstab each other. We bring each other down. And you don't see men. I'm not saying, you know, like men don't do that as much as women, right? right. Like I was at a networking event last week. And, you know, I'm, I'm just observing the room, right? And men, mm -hmm. you know, they meet each other, they talk, and then right after, they're like, let's catch up, let's do business. And it's that simple versus women sometimes. It's like, you know, they got to stare at you sometimes or they look mm -hmm. at your outfit and they're like, oh, right. how could she wear that? Oh, who's this new person? And, you know, those are just some, some of the things that women go through, right? And it happens right. more often than we realize. So, of course, of course, we're also part of the problem, right? If we don't move forward, if we don't learn to collaborate with each other, nothing happens. And, you know, society always sees women as that superwoman who has to do everything themselves, not realizing we don't have to do everything ourselves because men don't do it on their own. They always have other people they collaborate with or outsource and things like that. And so women should, should be able to do the same thing. But I think also when you talk about where various women of color in the space – and I think it's also depending on the family structure, upbringing, and the discipline that's brought upon. Because I always feel like, and I'm not saying that we're at the highest levels of a, <clears throat> a business, but I mean, every, when I do see leadership, just like say every day, if I go and, you know, pass by a nail salon or dry cleaner or just some various businesses, you see, you know, just a mom and pop, it's a trade. And it's just, you see a lot of women that are in front of the counter and they're handling the day-to-day -day operations. I think that's also has to be considered is that where you can see in the Asian space, you're talking about, okay, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino. So like you consider, especially where I'm at in South Florida, you see a lot of discipline and you see that they're not necessarily so affected by, you know, the emotional quotient that you know, they handle business and there's, there's strong, you know, they kind of keep a strong fist of things. But they keep everything in control, managed, and things run pretty smoothly. I think it's something where I just feel like for other women of color, they should be looking where Asian women are coming from in terms of management and leadership. Because things are, you could just see where whatever they're given, small scale to a larger scale, they're handling it. It may seem like they're handling it, but... You know, like I said, culturally, we're told to just never make any noise. You know, we just right. do as we're told. We work hard. We bow our heads down because we don't want to make any trouble. And sometimes that silence really affects us because, as you can see, what's been happening in the U.S. and Canada, the rise of anti-Asian hate. Right. right. Most of the time, it's our elderly <clears throat> who's being attacked. And women are attacked two and a half times more than men. So if we don't say anything and we just let things slide, it's just going to get worse. Same thing in the workplace. Right. If we don't say anything, if we just bow our head down, work hard, never make trouble, even speak up, then they think we're OK. Not realizing right that we're not okay, right? It's just we've been programmed to just never say anything. And if you see recent reports, especially in the tech space, there's a lot of Asian employees who were fired for speaking up or for talk, for bringing up something. And, um, you know, this, it's not always easy to share something like that, right? Especially when you work for big tech companies. Um, you know, you're one against, you know, how many tech companies in like San Francisco. So, it may seem that way at times. I'm not saying it's that everybody goes through that, but for some people, especially in our culture, you know, it, it may seem like we're fine, but really we're not. And sometimes we're just afraid to ask for help. 
um, because, uh, you know, it's seen as a weakness or a handout. And so for me, it's really important to talk about these things, to talk about, you know, be okay to ask for help, be okay to share your feelings, be okay to um, say you're not okay, right? Because then we can find ways to move forward, to heal from that so we can show up as our best self. Because Asian or not, we go through some form of trauma, right? And we carry a lot of trauma, not only our own trauma, but the trauma of our ancestors, the trauma of our parents, our grandparents. And if we constantly keep that in and not say anything, then we're just like a ticking time bomb waiting to explode. Right. And when you're talking about uh, in terms of Asian Americans being denied tech leadership roles, <clears throat> going to court, I see that came from USA Today and there have been issues where that's becoming an issue altogether. And this is where part of these companies... I think part of the thing too is that some of these companies, I mean, who, no matter who founded it or who is leading it today, there is a lot of where they feel like, and I really feel like this is true, this performative aspect that whoever they want to bring on board, they need to have diversity, equity, inclusion as a visual and nothing else. And it doesn't make much more in terms of the acumen or the, the knowledge or what somebody brings to the table the merit and that's one of those things that's a, a constant issue right now from the guests that you bring on is that something that you hear quite a bit of what are the, what are the if there's any you can see there were three constants you always hear that are obstacles that your guests always bring across what would those three things be i think the obstacles most of my, my guests feel mm. is um you know it's more about not feeling good enough um you know not having a lot of self-worth feeling like, um, you know, they have to please everybody before they please themselves, especially mm-hmm. in our culture, right? We've been, ter- we've been told to serve everybody and forget ourselves. So like self-care and self-love is not part of our daily life. Right. And so um, when I interviewed these women, I realized I was going through the same issues they were going through, right? I feel like I had to please everybody else before I go out, th- you know, before I take care of myself. I always felt like I was never good enough or I was a total failure, uh, I, I resisted a lot. I over, I was overthinking about every single little thing and I always had to show up as my perfect self. Right. And then, you know, being strong meant, you know, you always had to have this strong character and not be vulnerable. And especially after the pandemic, I think there's a huge like mental health crisis. Vulnerability right. is our greatest strength. And so sometimes it's okay to say, Hey, you know, I got rejected today. <laughs> right. Or, Hey, you know, I'm not feeling great today. Or, right. Hey, you know, today is like, my confidence level is minus 100 versus the opposite. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> now, when it comes to your podcast, it's, it's adapted off of the book that you also have, <clears throat> also titled The Tao of Self-Confidence, A Guide to Moving Beyond Trauma and Awakening the Leader Within. I want to take just right off the top, or just on the subheader of the, of the book, that you make the point about how in the midst of the pandemic, intergenerational and historical trauma, false stories we tell ourselves and how we rise above stereotypes. You're tapping into inner joy, celebrating your authentic self and awakening the leader within. So the trauma that you say, it's you, you use the word trauma, which is always a a very strong word. And always, it feels like it's something where it's, it's no, a, a lack of control or being held down. So, when you put that into the book here, mm-hmm. what's the level of trauma if for those that might not understand? It's not a sexual trauma. It's, it's there's something else, an emotional trauma of some sort. What would you identify it as that you're trying to help other women with your book and the podcast series overcome? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different traumas that we go through, right? It could be through our childhood. It could be through our traditions. It could be, you know, PTSD, sexual violence, mental health. Um, you know, th- there's so many different things. And then just, um, you know, historically what we've gone through in different countries in Asia, uh, also the model minority myth, how that affects us. Um, and, and intergenerational trauma is really prevalent, right? If you've been taught one way of living from generation to generation to generation, and that's all you know, I mean, you're also transferring all the gener- you know, intergenerational trauma that our ancestors have gone through. So sometimes we're not aware that there's something holding us back from moving forward. And in order to become the best leader, we need to work through that. We need to find ways to heal through that or else, you know, it's just the same cycle over and over again. And I was, as I was looking at different leadership books to see, you know, what was that one thing that was missing? I realized a lot of them were like rigid manuals, right? And we're all different. We're going to 
um, do things differently. And this is not just like another rigid manual. It's just like a guide, right? It's like, this is what I've also been through. This is some of the things that I've done. It may or may not help you, but there's different ways of doing things. And then the best thing is you can pick and choose what works for you. So, I mean, trauma is something that we never talk about. And I think it's something that we have to address because it's not only Asian culture that goes through it. Every single person goes through it, right? Um, Maybe there's something in your childhood that you didn't realize is stopping you from moving forward. So like for me, when I uh, went to kindergarten in the Philippines, I failed kindergarten for coloring outside the lines of a photo. Um, And that carried with me throughout my adult life. And for the longest time, I always felt like I was a failure. And it all stemmed from that one moment in time when I was five years old, coloring a photo outside the lines, thinking I was was a failure, not realizing that actually I was, that was just a sign that I was always meant to color outside the lines, you know, live life differently, not go through that typical way of living. And if I didn't do the inner work to realize that, then I wouldn't be here today. So, you know, it's just really a deep dive, you know, being aware of the things that we go through um, and then finding ways to move past that, to heal from it. You know, whether it's asking for help, seeking a mental health therapist, um, you know, cr- having a support system, um, you know, trauma is not just one thing. There's many aspects of it. It's very, you know, it's very complicated. And, you know, I just do my best from my point of view and the research that I've done to show you different types of trauma that me, you may or may not be aware you've gone through in your life. One of the shows that I helped to produce is a show called Market Edge, and the host is Larry Weber. And at that time, he did a lot with the podcast interviews to go ahead and write books that he would write for his basic leadership management. And he's the person that actually was uh, with Weber Chandwick. He founded the firm that created the Got Milk campaign back in the uh, 90s. I want to know if that's something that you do right now with the podcast where – at the moment, you now have a new book that you put in as part of your Women Who Boss Up series, and it is a book called Phenomenal Women Who Boss Up. Uh, amazing Stories profiles women who have broken into the mold to achieve, overcome difficulties that inspire change through relentless endeavor. And the various disciplines include STEM, healthcare, finance, coaching, and nonprofit. So when you prepare for these books, along with everything else that you do, has, has the podcast been used as – a way of getting a bit of a transcript or getting that interview that you wanted to have with a particular leader in the space that you can use in the book? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually don't use my interviews to use as a transcript for the book. We have another, uh, a separate one that we do, but I do invite guests that are part of the book um, into my podcast. So yeah, (laughs) because, um, because for me, like the podcast just serves as that support system. And um, that's, that's really it just being able to share stories, be able to help them promote what they're doing, whether if they have a book, if they have um, a product or service that they're promoting, uh, especially as women, right? Self promotion is something that we're not really good at, because, you know, it's seen as shameful, you know, not ladylike. But you look at the movie barbie right the barbie movie has made over a billion dollars worldwide and one point how are they able to do that Mm -hmm. and how are they able to do that through constant promotion like you couldn't go anywhere without seeing the color pink every single company in the world wanted to collaborate with them with them right there was even a pink xbox you know a pink or a barbie (laughs) xbox there's a lot of airbnbs that have like barbie style mansions and so you know for me it's like you see that and as a woman, you should be okay to feel, you should feel okay to promote yourself out there. Okay. Because no matter what, we're not going to please everybody, right? Someone's going to be out there going to say you're too much, you're too extra, you're too this, you're too that. But does it really matter at the end? What really matters is the positive impact that you're creating, right? What if someone sees your product and service, they, they purchase it, and it literally changes the course of their life? I mean, how good would you feel after that? Like, right. you know, we thought Barbie was just, we didn't even know what Barbie was about, but it was more of like, you know, creating these, 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 um, you know, these characters that, you know, what does it mean to be a woman and things like that. And then being able to break records, showing that this is the highest gross movie ever, a uh, grossing movie ever that's directed by a female. Right. Right. Um, again, we've break, we've broken another barrier. We've opened the doors for more possibilities. And that's why for me, it's so important to showcase things like that, to share these stories, to showcase leaders and the stories that they've been through. But I'll tell you one thing, when it comes to women in leadership and just women being able to succeed in the world of business or wherever they're, whatever their plan is to be, I like the part where, you know, it's building the merit and having the traits to be able to go and succeed 
where I don't worry too much about other people having to go and help me get to that spot. Or, I mean, I want mentorship. I want, you know, collaborative efforts. But if I want to make it somewhere, I want to be able to make it on my own and not be brought up because of something that is not part of my merit. So, I mean, just for – that's where I come across with it when it comes to – I don't need to be here because I check a box. And that's where I want to lead into one more question I want to ask you about. And then I want to ask you about the book and how, where everybody can find all your information, all your books, find your podcasts and other, and where they can meet you to, to speak. But I want to ask about this, where this past June, the Supreme Court United States has voted to curb affirmative action in higher education. And from all, a lot of stories we kept reading about when the, the, decision came down a lot of asian americans were affected by who was being allowed to go ahead and be accepted into colleges and various institutions especially ivy league schools and it reversed decades of precedent upheld by majorities that included so the thing was he said that the decision impacted how all colleges and universities use race and their admissions practices and now forces institutions of higher education to look for new ways to achieve diverse student bodies so they've changed all that what do you think about that decision, and does that now open the door for more Asian Americans and just for more Asians that want to come in as foreign students into American schools? Is that something that looks as as a very big uh, as a positive going forward to bring new leaders into the fold? Um, you know, it that I mean, when I saw that, some a part of me felt like it could also create a negative impact. You know, there's been a lot of. Um, hate against Asian stories, especially after the pandemic. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you see the media, you know, there's um, a lot of hate between just different cultures, right? And now this comes out, the affirmative action, it's like, we're back to square one again, we're going to be seen as that person to be targeted, because we take in someone's space, when in reality, that's, that wasn't a rule that we created. It was a rule that Supreme Court created, right? So, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's hard to, (laughs) to, especially because i don't live in america i live in canada right Um, right but for me that's that's how i feel that uh, the affirmative action has actually it's actually gonna affect us in a negative way because now it's not about um you know because we're asian we can get in it's like oh now you're asian now you get the chance and then you're taking my chance and then it becomes more hate put on different different cultures right um and that's not something that we want either right this is not about hating on each other it's about like you mentioned like just getting a fair play at things um but it's probably just done not in a way that can benefit everybody right we always want to create create win-win situations and i don't think this one is one (laughs) but now in canada just to bring on this point there, they had the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and it does not explicitly stipulate affirmative action for higher education, but treating group preferences as legally compatible with equal protection. And it's a much different story because you have Aborigines, uh, people with disabilities, visible minorities of various other areas that America might not have to be privy to as well. So, the thing is, is I mean, do you think? What do you think would be the ultimate change that you see? We don't know what it might be now knowing what admissions for schools are coming up. But uh, I would love to know what you think will be the outcome of those that are looking to, you know, strive to be the women like yourself and your guests want to be. What are what is the outlook they're going to be looking forward to now that this has changed? I live in one of the most multicultural cities in the world, right? And for so long, you know, I never saw anybody in the media that looked like me. And it was important to showcase, you know, diversity in a way also that doesn't, like you mentioned, check the box. That's not what I want either, right? right? Um, We don't want to be seen just to check off a simple box. We want to be seen as, you know, we're talented. We can make things happen. We have uh, ideas that can help the company grow. But because, you know, based on our skin color, sometimes that stops us because they see us by a certain stereotype. And so, you know, being able to have um, more programs where we can all have this fair play would would help us a lot. Um, and then being able to see that in different fields, you know, it just shows us what's possible. Is it going to be easy? Probably not. It's probably, you're probably gonna have to work 10 right. times harder. And that's what I think most people don't understand. Like, 
it takes work. And especially as women, sometimes you've got to go out there and just make the first move, right? I mean, as women, you know, we're always told to wait for things to happen. It doesn't help that Hollywood, you know, has these like movies where Prince Charming is always going to save you. Uh, but in real life, no one's saving you, right? Like you've right. got to go out there and make get those opportunities that you want. And it doesn't matter if people call you like crazy or too much. Um, you know, what really matters is what kind of impact you want to create, right? I'm sure, you know, people have called me all kinds of names, but, you know, I've learned to let it go because I have a bigger purpose, right? right. I want to show, I want to show Asian women what they're capable of. I want to show them that they can be leaders. They can be the president if they want it. They can have a nine figure business if you, they really want it, but it takes work on their end. It's not going to be a, um, a walk in the park. I mean, if you look at, you know, Asian Americans in Hollywood, right? It took them decades to get the notoriety that they have today, right? It wasn't overnight. And I think sometimes we're in this like generation where no one wants to deal with the work. And, so, and sometimes you got to put in the work, right? For things to happen. We got to take action, even if we're right. scared, even if we're nervous, even if half the time we don't even know if what we're saying makes sense, right? We just gotta, <laughs> gotta go out there and do it, make mistakes, course correct along the way, and you'd be surprised what the, like, how much impact you can create or the results that you wanna right. create. Um, and that takes a lot of confidence and courage, especially as a woman, cause I know it's like, for me, I always waited for things to happen because I was like, well, I can't go out there and ask people to do this or ask people to do that or, um, and for so long, I delayed my own success because I was too oh, afraid to mm -hmm. go out there and make that move. And the moment I realized, like, I can just go out there and reach out to people, um, that's when everything really started happening. Because I, I just said, you know what, I'm not going to wait another five years. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And so um, I think just telling more authentic stories is really important. Sharing our specific stories is really important, especially, you know, for me, I was always rejected because I was told you know, what I did catered to a specific audience, but I never understood that. Like, what does that mean? What makes me specific? Is it because I have smaller eyes, a flatter nose? Like, what is it? Right. I'm um, not realizing, you know, we're all human beings. We all have different stories and having specific stories from different cultures. And so is so important because we can find different solutions. We can see things from a different perspective and then we can learn something new from other cultures. Right. I mean, I love, I love <clears throat> learning from different cultures, especially food. Like, you know, food. is Oh my is, goodness. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's not just the food, it's the music, it's it's just the whole lifestyle. Culture yeah. is, is a great point, and I think that needs to be understood more, is that when I think all across the board of people that I've ever got a chance to hire myself, or people I got to work for, I'm always thinking about their culture. And, and I just and for other companies that I see who's in, you know, we one of the shows that I actually also got to produce a lot was a show called Purse Strings, and it was marketing women. And the host is a six-time Emmy-winning news producer, uh, Maria Retan. Loved working with her for over a decade doing that show together. And just the, the level of women we had on that program. And then she was doing also a show called Dream Possible. And we just saw all these different people that were brought on board that, that did exactly that. I still think of another company where... I think of Vanessa Gabriel. She uh, Asian. Uh, I think she's Filipino American. And remember, just having an idea where she was working on some other business and decided to do a delivery business for cannabis in the same way. Created just something that was just, you know, there was not much income into it, but was able to go ahead and apply, empower, and just she's running the business and it's still very successful today. And I just think about. Also, and the how young she is, and how many the other women we've had in the space that were young that got into the space and broke barriers didn't matter anything else. I think there's something to be said about in the Asian culture. There is family structure. There's the culture itself, a discipline, a feeling of you know if you want to trust someone that's going to be reliable, trustworthy, and is going to do the job, and they know how to apply. I think I always. In my space, I always thought if you know if I found someone that was Asian American, either man or woman, I'd have to look at that always as a plus. I don't know why it wouldn't be not an otherwise, but that's where I just look at things. I just feel like there's a respect there, and I'm and I don't understand where some companies, you know, if. I just don't get the part where people just don't see merit and they don't see where upbringing and background are the traits that really increase the mold of a person and who they are and who they're going to be when you bring them on board. That's just me. 
with that said, let's go ahead and talk about what you're doing. Again, you're doing so much. So you also speak, and I, I want to know, uh, want to know specifically what are the areas that you like to go and speak about the most? Is it still based on the books and the podcasting? Is there anything that you normally as a go to that you're always asked for to speak about? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I, I speak on different topics, of course. Confidence is one of them, especially mm-hmm. companies. They, you know, they constantly tell me how their employees, you know, confidence is the biggest issue they deal with, especially for the women. So, um, one of the favorite topics that most companies look that I usually talk on is about the confidence gap because there is a huge confidence gap between men and women. And there's been studies where if women just applied and took action, we actually do better than men. Then not that I have anything against men. I think it's great. You just go out there without thinking and make things happen. <laughs> right. And even when I talk to different men, you know, I like ask their story. I just ask them what they do. And half the time they don't know, but they just go out there and make it happen. And as women, if we apply that same mentality, you just imagine how much we can accomplish. So that's one of them. Um, now that the book is out, you know, trauma is really a big big topic because mental Mm -hmm. health is huge, especially in the workplace, especially after the pandemic, right? I mean, people who are working from home were actually more overworked than working in the office because they're not, especially women, because they're not only dealing with their job, they're dealing with family life, uh, homeschooling kids, taking care of family, running errands, running chores, and they may even have a side business that we don't know, right? There's so many things. And, you know, as companies, um, you know, need to have resources that really can help them with their mental health because if their mental health is affected, then the productivity goes down, right? You want to be able to help them so that your productivity goes up. And when productivity goes up, guess what else goes up? Your profit margins, right? And so that all is in full circle. And I think some companies don't realize how important it is to have these, these programs in place and not just like surface level programs, but really like actual programs that can really help them. Because, um, you know, I've seen some other companies where it just, it doesn't, like, I look at it and it's like, is that really helping someone or is it, is it just making you look good? <laughs> you right, know? right, right, right. Um, we need to have actual programs that can help them because we don't know what they're going through, especially, uh, you know, in our culture with the rise of anti-Asian hate, like, you know, a lot of Asian women are getting very paranoid and I don't blame mm-hmm. them, right? They can't even like, sit in the subway peacefully because they're afraid someone might attack them. They have to look at their every shoulder as they're walking to the car. Right. Um, you know, last year there was a, a lineup of people in New York to buy mace and it was like an eight hour lineup and it would like zigzag all over New York city. Right. And, and, you know, it's important to have safe spaces, right? Even sometimes when I travel to the U S I start having anxiety because I'm like, Oh my God, what if like I'm walking in broad daylight and someone just attacks me because of the way I look? Right. You know? Um, and it's hard and not everyone understands that, you know, especially if you've never dealt with racism or prejudice or sexism, like you will not understand what we go through or that, that fear or that paranoia or that anxiety level. And that all, um, affects our mental health too, too, right? Because that's all we think about. And even worse when you're attacked. I mean, the PTSD that goes with that, right? Like racial right. trauma is prevalent too. Um, and and if we don't have the resources to work through that, then it's going to keep haunting us. So um, that's another thing, like trauma, the different right. kinds of trauma. Um, it's so important. And then just different ways to build confidence, right? And then um, sometimes I just share my experience, you know, when it's like, um, you know, Asian Heritage Month, you know, why it's right. important to have representation and things like that. But the biggest topic really is confidence, uh, because a lot of people deal with confidence. I mean, I still deal with confidence. I'm not always confident. I mean, even just chatting with you, and I'm like, oh, my God, I hope. <laughs> Whatever I'm saying makes sense. I mean, we all go, th- we all think like that, right? Or when right. I wrote my book, I'm like, oh my God, I hope people will like it. I mean, it's normal. It's normal to have these thoughts or to go through imposter syndrome. But instead of using it to, um, to stop us, it, we should use it to move forward. Like, right. uh, Bono, every, you know, before he goes to a con- uh, performs at a concert, he's actually scared, he, but he uses that fear to pump himself up to give the best performance ever. Oh yeah. Um, and that's what I do when I speak. I mean, I get anxious all the time. You know, I get nervous. I'm like, oh my God, I hope I give the best talk. And instead of me like backing out, I said, okay, I'm going to use that and just give the best performance ever. So being able to utilize the negative emotions we have for something good versus holding us back. Yeah. Even if you are self-confident, you found all the confidence in the world, you're always going to have to keep reinforcing it. 
and reapplying it, just like you said. It, and and everyone that is of, if they don't feel like they have those kind of bouts where they have a little bit of uh, unsuredness, then just realize that everybody has that. But I, I can tell you, just to, to me, I hope the more Asian women just realize that you know, just their worth, their value, and what they can contribute to any business or any kind of a leadership role. That yeah, you know, I mean, there are those companies that people are just are just. You know, they're, they're dumbfounded. They don't know it any better. And, you know, probably should not be in positions of leadership, but either which way, that shouldn't hold anyone, that shouldn't hold any age woman back from being successful. Because I think of any particular spectrum of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I would think age women should be able to succeed greatly in whatever they decide to apply themselves to. Uh, again, I've been here with Sheena Yap Chan. The book, the podcast, The Tao of Self Confidence. And now the website for you is SheenaYapChan.com, S-H-E-E-N-A-Y-A-P-C-H-A-N, the website, or you can also look for the book, the order the copy of The Tao of Confidence, and I also see all your books are on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the major bookstores, and let me just give you another minute just to go ahead and put whatever point you want to put across in terms of that first, just that, that initial point to those women out there that might be listening of what they should be doing in order to apply what you're trying to put in these books and from what you hope that you and your guests have been able to go and get out to the audience that they should know about and that what they should do in order to take that first step to their own self-confidence. I mean, I think it's when it comes to confidence, we feel like we have to make big leaps to get the results that we want, not realizing it's the small, actionable daily steps that's really important to be, yield that big result. So like a lot of people want to write a book, but they think it's like this daunting task they have to do and they you know, put it away for 10 years, but they still have this 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 yearning to write a book. So for me, it's like if you really want to write a book, just start with a page a day. Start with a page a day every single day for a year. You'd, you'd have enough pages for one book, in fact, two books if you really wanted to. So it's really just starting small and then slowly increasing it, right? Um, like for me, I wanted to start jogging, right? Because I just wanted to get fit. But the first time I jogged, I couldn't even run a meter. It was pitiful, <laughs> actually. That was in my 20s, which is make, makes it even worse. A couple but, years ago, a couple of years ago. Well, you can say that. <laughs> well, it's way longer than that, but decades oh. ago, let's say. Um, but I realized, okay, we're going to suck in the beginning, right? Sometimes we're going to embrace that suck and realize, you know, that was bad, but doesn't mean we failed. It's just, you know, it was bad, but we can pick ourselves back again and keep going. It went from going from one meter to two meters to three meters to now being able to jog an hour straight. But that wouldn't have happened if I didn't have that first initial one, right? Sometimes we have this picture in our head thinking like when we first try something, it's going to be rainbows and butterflies, going to be picture perfect, not realizing it's going to be a hot mess. And so I think when people realize we're going to suck, it's okay to just keep moving forward. Even like with podcasting, when I first had my podcast, like I was like, oh my God, I'm terrible. I don't even know what I'm doing. Like I'm going to be a total failure, but I kept at it, right? I kept at it and here I am today, not only a podcast, but with a book, but that wouldn't have started if I just didn't go out there and just take it one step at a time. You know, Rome wasn't built in the day, so don't expect yourself to do the same thing. Right. Agreed. Thank you so much for being on with us, Sheena. I really do appreciate you taking time out and uh, again, best of luck. And uh, I hope people really hear this and they draw to you and what you're doing in terms of your podcast, the books, the speaking engagements. Uh, anything you can tell us in terms of where people can find you if, when you do speak? Where's the best chance they can go and catch you at a speaking engagement? Yeah, um, you know, just connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Sheena Yapchan. It's actually my favorite social media. So I always have updates or when my next events are and things like that. Or if I'm, you know, at a bookstore near you, you know, um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And by the way, congratulations. I mean, I see you're up to 868 episodes of the last check. That's incredible. I mean, I I thought I was doing pretty good with my wrestling podcast, doing 780 some odd. But you've been around there for a long time, and it's, uh, you obviously caught on and adopted this pretty early on. So congratulations on that, and congratulations on the books. I hope they sell Thank really you. well. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're going to leave it there. And for those that want to go and continue to listen, of course, the website is kingofpodcast.com for all my content. And I hope you all enjoyed this episode of Podcasters. We'll talk to you next time.